Detroit, live from beautiful downtown Southern Maryland. It's time for Gears of Resistance, episode number 21 for the 17th of April, 2016, um, because we are like two months behind, because life is happening faster than I'd like to admit, and uh, so that's why it's been such a long time, but we got a good episode today, we got a lot of stuff. Uh, today's uh, discussion is going to be kind of about... Um, so you know, this is focused on open source hardware, which tends to be embedded electronics. But we're going to talk about all the stuff that sort of goes along with that if you're trying to make a complete product. And so basically, we're going to look at today's stuff that you can find at your local craft store, your arts and craft store, that actually can be used to do prototyping and production. So stuff that you wouldn't necessarily think of, um, that you're going to repurpose some of the stuff. The, it makes sense why you use it. Other stuff we're going to repurpose for electronics purposes, but it all makes sense um, mostly at the end of this, hopefully. So anyway, um, with that, we're going to go ahead and just jump into it because i got nothing else really to talk about. Uh, again, apologize for the delay between these episodes, between this and Steam Power Podcast. Um, you know, these are pet projects that we don't do full time. And uh, unfortunately, they've had to be put on the back burner here for a while. Um, and maybe, hopefully here, we're going to start bringing them back out and we'll be doing this uh, back to a bi-weekly schedule. Um, if not, we may go to a monthly schedule, but we'll see. Anyway, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's do, 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 bring up the screen sharing thing and see if this all... The big test is going to be if I can remember how to do any of this stuff. Um, you know, you lose it, you don't use it, you forget it. It's not like riding a bike. That's... That's not the screen I want to share. This is the screen I want to share. Here we go. All right, here we go. Uh, all right, so um, a few months back now, um, Arduino or Genuino, uh, but the Arduino.cc side of the house, um, which is where Massimo uh, and uh, some folks landed, um, introduced the maker or mkr 1000 um and if you're outside of the united states it's the genuino mkr 1000 uh thank you uh lawyers and copyright laws and other such things i know it's important it is but anyway it is a little silly too um so anyway this board is basically love you know it's like a you know a stick of gum um it is uh, the functionality of a the uh, Arduino Zero that came out. So we're talking ARM-based processors now. Um, system on a chip, 32-bit, all that magic words. Um, but it also has Wi-Fi built in. Because let's say it, if it's the Internet of Things, you got to be able to wait to connect to the Internet. Um, the other cool thing, and the reason I'm going to pick one up to play around with, is it also has... Uh, ECC 508 crypto authentication. Now, I'll admit that I don't know exactly what all that means, but I know that one of the big problems for Internet of Things in general, uh, aside from the ability for things to actually interoperate with each other and talk to each other, um, the next big thing is security, right? I mean, this stuff is on the Internet. The Internet was never built with security really in mind. We've tried to reverse engineer it into there, a little bit of security, but... Um, the, you know, historically, the problem with these little, you know, embedded platforms, little microcontrollers is, you know, they don't have a lot of computing horsepower historically. Now, again, as we shift from the Atmel AVR type of Arduinos to these now, you know, ARM Cortex, which is basically, you know, better than a, most computers we had five, ten years ago, um, you know, these things are... are rapidly becoming um, capable enough to add in things like uh, SSL, you know, secure socket for internet, um, connectivity, making sure that your connection is secure, and some other neat things. So anyway, long story short, I'm going to try one of these. It is one order. Um, some uh, things to note, it is a 3-volt board, 3.3 um, volts, so be careful you know, a lot of historical Arduino stuff was five volts. So while you can, um, you know, kind of take the three volts and as an output to a five volt device, you know, you'll, your, 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 uh, mileage will vary, but 
pumping five volts into the Arduino is not a good thing. It'll make it very upset, and the magic smoke will get released. Uh, but anyway, uh, you can check it out the other information. There's also a really good explanation here about uh, lithium polymer batteries and why you have to uh, get those kind of matched up for your internal device. There's a little, it basically does a good explaining of, you know, if you don't, you know, why do LiPo batteries tend to catch fire, explode, blah, 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 overheat? They explain why it's important and that why you should get batteries that match their specification. So that's another little, little thing I kind of learned as well. Uh, anyway, so speaking of that, so in like all good things, when you want to tinker with a new board, you want to have a good project to play with. So I went off to the interwebs. Uh, Hackster.io is now one of my uh, favorite go-to sites for looking at project ideas. Um, and in stumbling around, I found a, um, looking up the, the Maker 1000, uh, I came across this little project from Ryan Gill. I'll give him his credit. Uh, he is at uh, hackster.io slash Ryan Gill 2. Um, surprisingly, I guess there's a Ryan Gill 1 out there. But anyway, he did a plant monitoring system. And um, while I don't think we have a live plant in our house, um, what was cool about it is that it introduced me to something called Johnny 5. So let me scroll down here. Uh, all this pretty, you know, screens, graphics, charts, sensor data. Um, is basically Johnny five is a JavaScript framework that lets you program all kinds of whiz bang, crazy uh, embedded systems. So let me hop over to their website real quick. Um, so if you are a child of the eighties, um, you will very much remember short circuit, the movie with Johnny five, the robot, I believe there was two movies, um, the second one should not be spoken of. The first one was much, much better. But the cool thing about this is that basically you can now program uh, in JavaScript, if that is your language of choice, um, and you can now reach out and touch all these different host boards. So they so let's go look at all of them, all the ones they have. Uh, Arduino, Tessel 2, which uh, I'll admit, don't know. Um, Spark Fun Reboard, all the Arduinos. Uh, yep, all the Arduinos. The Bot Borduino, the Chip Kit Uno, Uno 32. Um, so um, uh, so let's see here. DFR Robot, the Romeo, the Teensy, Beagle Bone Black, Chip Computer, yay. If you, well, I don't know if we talked about that. I have to go back and look at the notes. I got a chip and it's really cool. It's not bad for a $9 computer. Um, the electric imp, uh, the Galileo boards, the Edison boards, um, light blue bean. We've talked about that one before. PC Duino, uh, basically the Raspberry Pi. It goes on and on and on. All the boards, the particle core, uh, uh, particle.io, the, the the photon. So I will save it that there's a lot of boards that uh, this thing works with, and I know I'm going like warp speed, but um, I have literally just found this like about 12 hours ago um, in a late night um, internet binge. So I'm going to try this out. Um, basically, you install Node.js. Uh, you make a little, there's a little thing you uh, put on your board um, and then off and running. And you're now you're running uh, JavaScript um, or you're writing your code in JavaScript and then uh, the magic happens. So I wanted to share that one. Moving on. Um, microchip. So um, I think what's all, I think this is not old news, but um, microchip has bought out Atmel, um, which Atmel, again, the AVR microcontroller is what powered the original Arduino Um and a couple of the subsequent ones. Um, PIC microcontrollers were, uh, there's, a, you know, they're, they're kind of like, um, they're the more the workhorse. Like there was, just, there's literally tons of PIC microcontrollers. Almost any configuration of hardware you want, you can find a PIC that has it. With that said, historically, traditionally, and I think that's changing, 
um, they weren't as um, noob friendly. They weren't as maker friendly. They were really, uh, you know, you needed to know uh, your C programming. Um, you had to buy an external debugger programmer. So they weren't quite uh, that plug and play Arduino friendly. That again, because, you know, if I'm a business guy and I'm trying to always look how to expand my market share, uh, I would be looking over at this whole maker movement thing and be like, hmm, that's a whole new uh, source of potential revenue that, um, you know, outside of the professional engineering design, which you know, let's face it, at this point, you know, things, you know, markets mature and, and people get set in their ways from a, especially businesses. So how do you look to branch out? Well, Microchip um, has recently launched, let me get to the point, MP Lab Express cloud-based uh, integrated development environment. So now, just like Arduino's doing, um, Particle IO, um, you know, Adafruit, Spark, I'm sure uh, SparkFun. So all these um, companies are setting up um, basically cloud IDEs. Now it's two reasons. It's one, um, it makes uh, you know it more user friendly for people. Now today, you know, if you want to tr install a traditional IDE, you got to download the IDE, but you may also have to install Java, or you may s install some other third party framework, and then you've got to make sure that that there's compatibility uh, issues that you're writing the right versions. Basically, it can be a source of frustration for people that are not savvy on it. Cloud-based or basically internet-based uh, IDEs take that away. They they hide all that uh, complexity. They put it in the browser, and in other words, <clears throat> the company keeps all the code up to date, fixes bugs. Uh, you simply log into a website and code as you know you would normally. Um, and then there's various different there's different solutions on how then that code gets out of the cloud back onto your embedded device, but. The point is, it makes the care and feeding of the IDE um, ecosystem a problem for the manufacturer, not the user. Now, of course, um, you could always look at you know what's the pros and cons of that. The cons being, you've got to be connected to the internet, obviously. Um, <clears throat> and if the company ever decides to shut down and go away, um, you're kind of SOLs. Whereas you know, worst case with uh, something that you install on your computer is, you know, the guy stops writing code for it or stops updating it, you still have enough, um, you can still run it uh, on your computer. So trade-offs, um, overall, it's, you know, tends to be um, something that I personally, you know, don't prefer, um, but that's probably because I'm just an old fart and, or becoming an old fart, and I just like the, again, that, that feel good of having it installed. <clears throat> But with Internet of Things kind of coming, and, and we'll talk about that too, um, you know, having this stuff in the cloud is going to make talking to different, um, you know, data gathering tools that these companies are also setting up, uh, you know, it might just make logical sense if we do more Internet of Things kind of stuff. The other cool thing is there's an express board. Basically, it's a um, plug and play pick. Uh, no need for an external debugger programmer. They put that on there. It's USB. You plug it in with the micro USB cable, <clears throat> and you can uh, go off and program um, without having it to buy like a pit kit. The cool thing is, um, and I forgot which I think was we were using. Uh, it's like the Nucleo, and that when you're done, you write the code. Um, it dumps out a little hex file. You literally just drag that. Uh, your the the the, the um, Express board looks like a little, you know, basically a thumb drive or an external drive. You just drop the hex file into it and it magically programs. So anyway, it is cool to see um, this, you know, convergence and this move into um, a new set of design of, of, of software development paradigm for embedded systems that is more, in my opinion, user friendly. Um, and uh, embraces the fact that, you know, the internet <laughs> is not a fad and it looks like it's going to be here to stay so anyway check that out all right so that's the the the, the real electronic stuff um now we're going to talk more about like okay so what happens if you want to do more than just a, the electronics when you want you want to actually make an entire prototype 
or an actual um, finished product for say a one-off thing for either you're doing like a costume something for a, some sort of con event um, or you're just making something for your house but you still want it to look good you want to maybe something that's going to go outside and you know can monitor your your plants or whatever <clears throat> how can you do some uh, really good um, you know again making not just the electronics but the entire product so with that I went to my local uh, arts and craft store down here where I live we have Michaels I think we also have a Joanne fabric but Michaels was closer uh, so depending on your neck of the woods you know there's gonna be different stores but the idea is head to your local craft store and um, <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff that makes sense, a lot of stuff that you will repurpose. The first thing is sewing machines. If you don't have a sewing machine, um, it's probably you know something that if you're really serious about doing uh, wearable electronics, you're probably going to eventually consider. <clears throat> the reason why you asked? Well, the story popped up here uh, on Gizmodo. Embroidered antennas and circuits are perfect for wearable electronics. So not only is it practical, it's the antenna, um, by making it look a little pretty, which as engineers, we're not always the best at. That's why we have designers. Um, you have this natural convergence of um, uh, form and function. And, um, you know, this is, you know, at this point, it's all, it's research. This is um, a university. Uh, that's doing some research on the work, but their uh, their work just recent, recently got posted in IEEE's antennas and wireless propagation letters. So you can go check that out on the IEEE website. Um, <clears throat> they talk about the different types of sewing machines, the filaments, the what they're, they're learning. Um, you know, what are some of the pros and cons of the technology that talked about, you know, the fact that they were able to, um, you know, they had, this was, I think, Ohio State. So they used, <clears throat> they embedded the antenna into the Ohio State logo. So again, it looks, you know, not knowing any better, it looks pretty, but it's also functional. So anyway, that's why um, I say sewing machines are going to become important because, you um, if anyone, I, I do sewing. I sewed all my Boy Scout patches on my uniforms. Um, <clears throat> doing things by hand um, is fun <clears throat> to a point, but it can be a pain in the butt, especially if you're trying to do something as intricate as this. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, when you're doing embroidery, not just sewing, when you're actually you know making the logo, which is also the antenna, you're not going to want to do that by hand. A sewing machine. So, um, you know, these are probably not cheap. These are probably a few hundred dollar sewing machines that can do that kind of, you know, uh, you know, design it in a computer, send it over, uh, and embroider machine. So you're not going to buy the, the low end sewing machines, but if you're just starting, um, maybe you'll try it. Um, but again, a lot of, uh, arts and craft stores are a great source to get, um, sewing machines and sewing machine supplies. So check those out. If when you're starting off, you're just going to do some stuff by hand, uh, here's something that I found in absolutely invaluable because I've done a, a, quite a few little um, wearables projects using the um, the was it the the what's the Adafruit version the um, shoot uh, the gem the Flora Gemma and the Flora. Um, so one thing you that when you're sewing electronics, so unlike you know when we do traditional electronics, you have that nice breadboard that you can put out wires. You cut, you know, you have jumper wires. Things are you can make things look nice and neat. When you're sewing, it's not quite as user friendly. Um, and cloth, you know, can give and take. Imagine like having a breadboard made out of cloth, and you know you can't really um, keep that taut by hand. That's where these little hoop set comes in. So um, if you head over again, I went to Michael's, pick this up. They're like, you can seven, eight bucks uh, for a kit of various sizes. And what you do is you facially, you stretch your fabric across this loop. You tighten it down. There's an inner loop and an outer loop. You sandwich your fabric in between those two loops. And now your um, project stays taut. You put your, or, you know, your embedded board on there and you take your conductive thread and it makes it a lot easier to sew um, nice circuit uh, traces 
um, than had you were to try to do it by hand and with the fabric all being loosey goosey. So that's something that, again, um, traditional <laughs> electronics engineers are not going to have, but electronics engineers of the future that do wearables are going to have these, I guarantee you. Um, another moving one, mandrel sets, ring mandrels. So for people that do jewelry, um, either like necklaces, wire jewelry, um, rings or whatnot, they use these things to make consistent circles or, or loops with their wire. Um, you can probably see where this is going. These are great tools if you ever are making your own custom little uh, inductors. If you want to make your own little coil, uh, these little mandrels, they come in all kinds of sizes. They've got some really big ones. These these uh, smaller, they're called bead, from a company called Beadalon. Again, traditionally, people that do bead projects use these things. But an electronics engineer, you can be repurposing these things. Uh, the nice thing is a mandrel, basically, for those who are not seeing it, um, not watching this, um, imagine a um, uh, basically a stick that has the, the stick next down um, <clears throat> in different diameters every couple, every you know half inch, quarter inch. Um, you go from maybe like a, something that's an eighth, uh, maybe a half inch in diameter, uh, all the way up to something that's maybe a sixteenth of an inch or an eighth of an inch uh, diameter. So you you have different basically places where you can if you need a a wire that's round at one half inch you go to the one half inch spot on the mandrel wrap your wire around if you need something that's only one quarter inch you move down to the quarter inch part on the mandrel and wrap your wire there very useful for again making coils and something that you know you could, could you use other tools could you make it yourself could you use a pencil sure but these things are nice and convenient because they have a variety of sizes all in one tool and um they're actually pretty cheap um one little hint for those who are not in the know this is at least work for michael's michael's um <clears throat> some of the stuff can be expensive um but usually um they have an app that you can get for your smartphone <clears throat> if not you can look on their website and print it out before you go but they always every day there's usually um like a 40% off coupon um, off of one item. So if you know, you've got something you, you know, just a couple bucks and you're like, wow, I could probably get that cheaper elsewhere. Um, and it's not good for everything. Like obviously if you were to go to there and buy a cricket, um, they're not going to honor that. They're not going to take 40% off of a, um, you know, a, a paper cutter thing. But for most of their stuff, <clears throat> they, uh, uh, it's, you can get 40% off of one item if you're lucky every now and then they'll have like 20 or 30 percent off the entire order um usually it's limited to like again not for things that are not on sale uh things that are not discounted and for you know obviously certain high tech high value uh things they won't use it for but <clears throat> now you know if you go shopping at michael's at least save yourself a few bucks all right moving on um this is the big one um so we just talked about Cricut. There is kind of like the, I don't know, they're, they're not necessarily open source, but they are kind of like the startup um, underdog. It's a company called Silhouette. Um, they have four different uh, systems, uh, three of which are actually paper cutters, or I don't, I'm don't. i going to butcher what they're actually really supposed to be called. Um, and then they have something that does, um, I guess, uh, like a little printer. But anyway, though, so we're going to focus on uh, the portrait, um, which is kind of like their introduction level, it does like uh, you know eight inches wide. Um, and traditionally, what this is used for is for people that do um, uh, you know uh, making photo books um, um, or paper crafts. Um, but it's again one of those things where um, when you look at it basically you you see other uses and they actually they're doing a good job <clears throat> they are making a push in the you know they're part of the maker movement um and they have these set of videos on different use cases so i'm going to go ahead and play this one real quick i don't know if the video will pipe the audio will pipe through but it's, in a, it's about industrial design and how industrial designers are using these uh paper cutters to do um prototypes
new tools and new capabilities end up leading to different results. When I found the silhouette, I ended up just drowning in the potential. I'm constantly frustrated that I'm only scratching the surface of the capability of the tool. The silhouette is something that I use almost daily. The first week that we had the silhouette in our studio at my new job, a factory made a mistake. We were running tight on a deadline. We needed to have a final product of the headphone piece that we were working on at a trade show booth. The 3D printing wasn't really an option in this situation. We didn't have three hours. We had 30 minutes. I took the CAD model. I unfolded it. I sent it to the silhouette. It cut it out for me, and I taped it up, and all of a sudden I had a real prototype of our design intent. All right, so that in a nutshell, um, hopefully that came through. If not, I'll post the link for it. But basically the idea is, um, you know, it's not limited to making um, picture books, photo books. Uh, my wife's going to kill me on what the, what's the actual scrapbooking. That's it, scrapbooking. Um, use case, which I think of a lot of these these paper cutters, but basically, um, imagine, you know, you, you feed in a piece of paper, there's an X and a Y axis, there's a, a sharp knife, uh, you send a, you know, a design that you want cut out, and this device moves the paper back and forth, and it moves the knife back and forth, like, like on the X axis, moves the paper back on the Y axis, and eventually you cut out a shape, which is, you know, cool. But what these industrial designers are doing is they're going into, um, you know, they're using, uh, you know, professional 3d cad software uh if you're an amateur we'll talk about the, some tools you can use too if you're looking to save a couple bucks but basically you make a 3d design um then there's tools that take that 3d design and unfold it so that it can be cut out with paper um and a lot of times you can just cut it by hand but the cool thing about these tools is it does it for you automatically so if you want to make a prototype of something three-dimensional um before you 3D print it, you can put it out on a piece of paper, fold the paper back together, and make sure that you get the look and feel. <clears throat> With that said, there's also a lot of people out there that are actually using this um, because you can replace the knife with a pen. And there are people that have actually been tinkering with doing circuit boards with this. So <clears throat> you do your, your design um, in Eagle or whatever, you export it as an image, uh, usually an SVG file. And then you replace the knife with a marker <clears throat> and it draws on the pert circuit board. And then you go through and you do the normal uh, etching process and you have your circuit board. So that's another use case. Third use case for makers would probably be uh, making stencils. So, um, you know, you're making a, uh, a box, you want to stencil some instructions or a title on it, you want to do some airbrushing. Um, you can use this uh, tool and this workflow to go ahead and make a stencil. You can also cut out vinyl <clears throat> and make stickers. Again, another way to add a little pizzazz to your final design. Um, there are <clears throat> so a couple tools um, that I use for design. So if you're doing if you're doing just stencils and you're only going to stay two dimensional. Um, you can check out the Pixelmator, um, which are for Mac, and then um, <clears throat> there's also Autodesk Graphic, which I think, again, is unfortunately only Mac. I thought it was also Windows. Um, but you can also use GIMP um, and um, what's the other popular one? Um, shoot i'll have to put it in the show notes i guess ink inkscape inkscape <clears throat> on linux and i think actually inkscape is linux windows and um os 10 but anyway so if you're doing just two-dimensional drawings you're making uh stencils those tools are way to go if you're doing three-dimensional stuff um check out sketchup or autodesk 123d um there's, they are both, uh, I know that 123D is, is both Windows and Mac. <clears throat> SketchUp, I know is Windows and Mac. I don't know if it's also Linux too. In either case, um, what I'm using to then take that and uh, the 3D designs and making them into flat is something called Pepecura Designer. Uh, 
this was uh, someone at our local makerspace mentioned it, checked it out. Um, <clears throat> it is Windows only and it is not free. It's like 25, 30 bucks, <clears throat> but it is pretty magical. You drop, you drop an STL file into it uh, and it automatically does all the magic to make it something that you can cut out by paper. Um, you can also then export, I think, um, the DWF file, DWG file, um, that the silhouette portrait, the silhouette software is free. Um, it can take that, it can take a 3D file or 2D file like that, um, or DWG or SVG, um, and then it can go ahead and slice and dice. Um, so the, I'll post, actually, I'm going to do that. I'm going to make a note for myself to uh, document the workflow on, on how to do that for both 2D and 3D designs. So um, either way, um, if you're doing 3D, um, I'm using this Peppercore designer to get to a flat 2D file. Um, if anyone knows anything else different, another tool, let me know, and we'll share that as well. All right, so that's the big part. That's the thing I really want to talk about was the silhouette portrait. Um, there's other some cool things like like uh, the portrait does something called pick scan. You can take a picture of something um, and it automatically with your with your smartphone and it figures out where to cut things out. So that's cool too. I haven't used that yet, but um, it's there if you need it. All right, moving on since we're running out of time. Um, so some other materials, things again to think about at your local uh, arts and craft store. Um, uncut mat boards. So typically, you know, f you when you make you know really nice, pretty pictures, uh, and you frame them, you put in a little mat board around it to give it a little something extra. Usually, the middle's cut out. Obviously, there's a picture in there, but you can get uncut mat board. Um, and the nice thing about this is it's it's kind of like as it's strong like foam board, but it's not as thick. And what you can do with this <coughs> is if you're you want you're testing out like different enclosures, you want and you want to make an enclosure by hand. Um, this lets you prototype an enclosure uh, before you mark. You can either then take that and learn from it, uh, and then make a 3D design file that you can either 3D print or again using the silhouette. Um, but I'm actually going to try cutting map board with the silhouette. I think it's thin enough. It should be okay. But if you're just prototyping, you can just get a pair of scissors <coughs> and cut out using map board to kind of, again, get the look and the feel of, a, of an enclosure before you actually go through with a final design and use more expensive material like wood or metal or plastics. Uh, <coughs> you can test it here with a, basically a piece of cardboard. So check that out. Other stuff, airbrushes. Um, if you read forums and whatnot, there's a lot of uh, discussion. On Michaels sells Badger uh, brand, which from what I can understand, uh, most people say is is a good. There's uh, Iwata, which is a, like apparently the professional grade. But Badgers aren't too bad. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on different types. Do you want the ones where that are gravity fed, um, where the paint is on the top and it feeds through by gravity, or do you want ones with little bottles that connect at the bottom? Um, that's a personal preference thing, as best I can tell. Uh, what I did learn is you definitely don't want to use just there's compressed air bottles; um, those are a pain in the butt. You want to get a compressor, um, and you want a compressor with a tank. So what happens is the the compressor. Um, basically fills this tank up with air, the tank stores it, and by having a tank, you can get a more consistent um, air flow. So it's not kind of like, you know, stopping and starting and having fits of breathing problems. Uh, you get a more consistent air, which is very important when you're trying to get a nice even coat with your airbrush. Uh, the, having a, um, a, a tank, you can also put a, um, like a moisture catcher at the end of it. So any moisture that comes out, you know, the compression as gases contract and expand, yada, yada, temperature changes could induces uh, you know, condensation. There's little traps that will trap that condensation so it doesn't feed into your air hose and again, makes your um, um, painting less consistent. I will say that probably don't want to get your compressor from Michael's I found, you know, you can get a really nice 
kind of no name brand off of Amazon for a lot cheaper. So I will throw that out, but um, they do have some pretty nice, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, airbrushes. And again, I, if what I recall, um, you can use like if you get like the forty percent coupon off, you can use those on the airbrushes. So you can get them cheaper than you could probably buy on Amazon. Uh, da, 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 da. Super Sculpey, another great uh, material for building a um, a prototype, <clears throat> for either for an enclosure or for some sort of user interface part. Um, Super Sculpey is uh, the apparently the pre very preferred, very nice uh, modeling clay. You can also pick up some modeling tools. Um, again, you know, look for to buy these um, with your with your with your coupon, and you can usually save a couple bucks. <clears throat> All right, moving into the home stretch now. Uh, over at Amazon. Um, I just recently bought this. I've been playing around with this. Um, Protoplast is a company that's making all kinds of weird filaments for 3D printers. I just picked up a electrically conductive carbon spool. Uh, it's PLA. It's 1.75 millimeters. Um, and it conducts electricity. I printed a little uh, two inch by two inch, maybe um, two, three millimeters thick a uh, little just square just to test it out. And when I put my mic, um, my multimeter probes on it at the diagonal um, at each corner, I get, I'm reading about 800 ohms. So um, depending on what your use case is, um, I will say it's very, very brittle. I mean, this stuff is like really, really brittle. So you're not going to build your entire enclosure out of this kind of material, but if you're looking to make little buttons, <clears throat> that can conduct um, uh, this stuff is is pretty good. Um, I will say that the the brittleness is is something that you've got to get used to. It's not like your normal PLA plastic. Um, so again, <clears throat> before you go whole hog and printing something complete, print out a couple small things, test it out, not just electrically, but also you know play with it mechanically, tug it, pull it, um, get a feel for what it can stand with it, what it can't stand. Um, I will say I, mine, I did not print with a heated bed. It seemed to do pretty good. They do recommend that, you know, you'll get a better print job if you do have a heated bed, but it's not required. <coughs> so take that into mind. But otherwise, um, yeah, it's pretty good. It's, um, on the upper end of cost on like compared to your normal, uh, um, filament for 500 grams, you know, usually you're talking like, you know, 15, 20 bucks. This is, you know, you can, you can find it on sale. So if you don't need it right away, wait on Amazon for a couple of days. You can usually it'll, they'll be go, they'll go down like 30 bucks or whatever. Um, but yeah, so this is my first time playing with a non standard material. I know there's, there's wood types, there's brass, there's all these different, um, um, new types of filaments that have composite materials built into it. Um, but this one works pretty good. This is the first time playing with electrically conductive filament and I was thoroughly impressed. And now I'm thinking of all the whiz bang things I can do with it. All right. Last thing for the day. And then we're going to call it quits. Um, Woodgears.ca. Uh, some young gentleman up in Canada. Um, <clears throat> basically it's a tool to let you design um, gears um as far as i know you can only do two gears there are some more expensive software out there that allows you to do um you know, multiple gears but <clears throat> for our purposes you can always you know link these two together you can do multiple design iterations but uh the the web there's a website you can do one on it's for it's free you can uh play around with it um he does have a, a Windows program that you can purchase for things like 26 bucks. That gives you a lot more control, a lot more different uh, features. But again, you can take these design files, print them out, and use them on the silhouette to prototype, um, and then take them, you know, export them or put them into a 3D design, uh, extrude them up, and actually make 3D designs from there. So again, one of those things where 
looking for you know how do we introduce different tools and different um things that we haven't done historically as embedded electronics people into as we grow into more complete and uh, robust product development kind of folks so check that out it's woodgears.ca uh slash gear underscore cutting uh but if you go to the woodgears.ca it should launch you to the website all right and i think that's yeah, that's all my tabs. Let's make sure this is all. So anyway, that uh, wraps it up for the week. Um, if there are any other tools that people are using that, you know, don't traditionally fall in the uh, toolbox of an electronics embedded kind of uh, tool, but, you know, from a maker perspective, um, let us know. Uh, share in the comments uh, send us an email let us know we can talk about it on a future episode which should only be like in another two or three months if our our record and average holds true <clears throat> but we are like so we are going to try to get back to a more routine um, as life calms down i keep saying that and then something else happens and then something else happens so i'm going to not say that this time because then i'm jinxing myself and ensuring that nothing like this will yeah that it does happen something like that Anyway, uh, if you're just joining us, uh, again, you can head over to gearsofresistance.com. If this is the first time you've ever seen this madness, and you can look at our last 20 episodes. Uh, we also do a show, Steam Power Podcast, at steampowerpodcast.com. It's more uh, just it's more of like a news. We discuss science and technology, engineering, art, and math news, whereas we here at Gears of Resistance kind of focus on just uh, uh, open source hardware, open source uh design uh maker kind of topics um that's this kind of thing here this craziness right here so with that i'm going to go ahead and bid adieu get everything lined up because yeah, um, i'm sure i've got stuff that i forgot to do this weekend and i don't get in trouble with the wife so thank you all very very much for listening and or watching and until next time keep it uh makery keep it we so usually say keep it steamy on the other one so keep it makey and stay quirky we'll figure it out anyway thanks for watching and see you all next time <laughs>